So what I'm going to do is I'll ask a few questions, but I know that you will definitely have questions in the audience as well. So I will open it up fairly quickly and we can have a great conversation, I hope. So start thinking. Um, Nina, just to kick us off, you've been making films since the 80s. You're a very established um, avant-garde filmmaker, but Brainwashed is your first documentary. And I was wondering if you could tell us why you chose to make this film, what was the context that created this film? Um, yeah, I mean, just for the record, I also, uh, I did make a documentary called Massacre um, in 2005 about the Sabra and Shatila murders um, in Beirut. But this is the first one that I produced and directed and not to mention uh, starred in, so to speak. Um, it was really um, a, a a process that didn't so much come from me, it came from outside. You know, all my fictional features um, were something that sort of uh, compelled me from the interior. You know, these films sort of appeared to me and demanded that I um, give up everything to make them. Uh, and they were not made with an audience in mind, they were just made because they needed to be made. Um, and uh, this film very differently uh, came about because I had this lecture that I'd been giving to my students for you know probably 20 years. Um, and after the EEOC investigation that Maria was talking about in the film that got women directors you know on the map, followed by the Me Too movement, there was sort of a space of interest in some of these issues that never had interest outside a very small kind of ivory tower group of people. And um, I wrote an essay for Filmmaker Magazine that sort of outlined the basic triangle, the three points. And uh, this article, right after the Harvey Weinstein um, uh, article hit the New York Times and launched the Me Too movement, I wrote this article tying the three things of the triangle. And this article went viral, and then it started uh, leading to invitations to give my talk. In fact, I gave my talk here at the BFI London Film Festival back in 2019. Um, and everywhere I gave the talk, people came up to me and were like, please make this into a film. Um, you know, we need this as a film. So it wasn't actually my idea. It was, it was an idea that it felt like I needed to do it. Um, because the time was right that, that people could hear it. Um, and so I approached Tim Disney, and he uh, agreed that the time was right, and he got his two sisters on board, and that's how um, we got the uh, essential money to make the film. The film is this amazing um, collage of clips that when you see it on the big screen is obviously quite propulsive and also quite horrifying <laughs> in places. And I think it's 175-ish clips in there, so it's a huge volume of material. And I'm just wondering how you found the, the films, how you chose the films, and then how you managed to wade your way through that material to find the exact moments that you wanted to include, because that must have been a huge research. Yeah, task. it was a huge job. I mean, it started with just films that I remembered, you know, that were, you know, uh, ones that I always thought of when I thought of this problem. And then as we built the film in editing, um, you know, we would think like, oh, you know, we need another, you know, few clips here and we need some clips here and we need to, you know, emphasize this point here. And so then we would, st you know, I spent every weekend, um, hours and hours and hours every weekend, I was scouring the internet. Um, and this film really could never have been made without the internet because can you imagine, like, pre-internet, how could you have ever found these clips? Whereas with the internet, I was able to do something like, you know, search um, young girls sexualized on film. You know, and it's like, pretty baby. Oh, yeah, pretty baby! You know? And then, like, you know, go on online, find the clip, pull it, cut it in. Does it work? Yes, it works. You know, then later we had to go back and by hand, because we had no time code, by hand, reconform, high res, every single clip. I, and that was an insane, sorry. Sounds mammoth. <laughs> yeah, it was mammoth. 
-hmm. And then you mentioned that it was a lecture, and obviously you, we see elements of the lecture on the screen, but yeah. this is also a cinematic experience. You've managed to create something cinematic from something that could have been quite inert. And that in itself, I think, is a really fascinating artistic task. Um, I particularly enjoy the homage to Vertigo at the start. I think that's really striking. I just wondered again what the creative approach was and how you managed to elevate it into a cinematic piece and how much that was at the forefront of your mind as well. Well, it was at the forefront of our mind that we wanted it to be cinematic. You know, at the same time, like we showed some early um, cuts to people who were like, you know, Nina, you should just be out and just do like voice over, you know, which is a more traditional essay film that it's just clip, 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 clip with a voice over without my presence there. Um, and we uh, thought about that quite a lot and, and decided that it was very, very important that my presence is there for a lot of reasons. Um, one being that it's like, in many ways this film, obviously it's very relevant to a whole lot of people, but it's also my personal story and it's my personal journey both as a, as a woman, psychologically, as a filmmaker, all the employment discrimination that I suffer and continue to suffer, um, and of course I'm not alone in that, and that, that my sort of physical body on the screen as, as, as a subject, but you know, and watching the films and, and figuring as a, you know, as a figure who's mediating some of those images, literally, physically, by sitting there, you know, in front of the screen and talking to an audience. So that was another thing that we thought about a lot is that, you know, obviously to make the point, we have to show the clips, you know, and, you know, how do we mediate some of those clips so that it's not just reproducing more of the same. So one of the ways that we mediated the clips is, you know, very short. Another way is voice over. Another way is my body standing there and you know, f functioning as like a mediator for the issue, hopefully. And um, you know, one friend of mine in Vienna said, you know, when we talk about you know Laura Mulvey's famous essay, which is uh, you know, visual pleasure in narrative cinema, you know, visual pleasure for whom? And the um, this woman said, you know, for me, she was she was telling me like. I got actual visual pleasure from having your body on the screen. So I don't know if that applies to everybody, but I, I was happy that that worked, uh, at least for her, that you know the presence there, it wasn't just like, oh, it's part of the lecture. I mean, we really thought about it a little bit more deeply in terms of the meaning of, of having me on screen and, and you know, being this like, you know, yeah. Intermediary. And it's an extension of the argument, right? Is to uh, yes. place yourself there and to say, I am the filmmaker making this work, I am a woman as well. That in itself is a kind of statement of a shift of gaze, although yeah. obviously that's not a default shift of gaze. We discuss that in the film. Yeah. And there's the whole thing of breaking the fourth wall, which we see as well with this picture of Tinker that yeah. happens a lot um, in feminist cinema. Yes. It feels like that's part of that argument too, of putting yourself there is to uh, yeah, reinforce sure. that point, right? Yeah, and also, you know, there, there's, there's been some pushback, you know. If I find it um, interestingly misogynist that um, some, um, there's, there's been a lot of great uh, response to the film. There's also been some nasty response to the film. And one of the nasty responses has been like, well, Nina Megas puts her own clips into the film. Like, how dare she do that? What a narcissistic, you know, self-congratulatory move. Um, and, you know, besides that the, the film is so much my own personal journey, it makes sense, and it's, it's, you know, there are quite a few other clips in there besides my own that I say, you know, these, all, these are some films that do it differently. Um, but I also really wonder if um, there would be so much uh, negativity if, if a male filmmaker was presenting, you know, uh, you know, four of their clips among 200 clips. Yeah, and there is, you know, De Palma on De Palma is a film. Like, there are lots of films where... Oh, yeah, but they, that's okay. Rain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> their own cinema history. Also, you know, make the film you want to make, you want to put yourself in, fine. I know, <laughs> but I'm reasonable. just saying, like, people got a little, yeah. like, upset about that, and I think it was misogynistic. Yeah. Um, Some people, not <laughs> And also, um, I think something that comes up 
in the film that I, I know as well has been controversial is the fact that you do include female filmmakers, mm. people like Sofia Coppola. Um, and I, I think you make quite a clear argument in the film that you know you have the Audrey Lord quote that you can't um, dissemble the master's house and the master's tools, that you need to find new ways of seeing. But I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that tension around including female filmmakers in there. Yeah, well, um, you know, Bell Hooks famously said, um, patriarchy has no gender. You know, it's not like the body of the maker is not the point. You know, the ideology of the maker is the point. And, and including female filmmakers was very important to show that, that it's not an essentialist situation. This is, this is an ideology that we've, most of us have internalized and many people reproduce, including women. Women reproduce it too. It just shows how insidious it is. And um, I, I, you know, the other thing is like how, you know, you shouldn't attack Catherine Bigelow because she was doing her best, you know, in an all male world. Well, I wasn't attacking Catherine Bigelow per se. I was just pointing out that this is a system, you know, and, and she's part of a system. And, you know, I, I don't know her motives, and that's not what I'm pointing out, nor do I feel like it's any of my business. I'm just pointing out a systemic problem. We all, I assume, film fans. We all love cinema here. Um, and I think something that is quite uh, challenging about your film is the way that it presents films that we love, uh, films that I know you love, like Metropolis, like Raging Bull, like, um, I mean, it's full of classic films, right? That's the point. But it points out the ways in which even those masterpieces of cinema, even, you know, um, revolutionary films in some terms, like Do the Right Thing, they also perpetuate potentially the same uh, gaze and the same power dynamics that have spread across the history of cinema and that have been um, oppressing women's expression and voices in cinema. And I wonder if how we, as people who love cinema, can reconcile those two tensions and still get pleasure out of cinema when we see these depictions at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a personal thing for every person um, to kind of wrestle with themselves, but definitely not in favor of, you know, cancel culture. I'm just saying, like, Let's bring awareness, you know, like Metropolis is one of my favorite films. I think it's a genius film. I think even that male gaze sequence from Metropolis is a genius sequence. That doesn't mean that it's not interesting to think about it and look at it and then say like, wow, that's a really classic male gaze sequence, you know? And guess what? That kind of sequence, you know, less beautifully done, has been reproduced, you know, a million times. So it's just, uh, you know, my belief is, you know, the film is not meant to be prescriptive. It's not meant to tell anybody what to do or how to shoot uh, your film or anything like that. It's, it's meant to illuminate something that has been so normalized, so normalized that, that most people really don't notice it anymore. And, you know, once we can illuminate that, you know, I do believe, I'm, I'm of the belief that consciousness is transformational and consciousness c does have power. So, you know, maybe with consciousness, some things will start to shift and I wouldn't want to be the one to say shift how. Well, there were, there were actually a lot of sort of so-called side streets that we decided not to go down just because it was overwhelming. And we were trying to keep sort of, you know, a consistent focus and flow. So, I mean, one of those side streets was like the whole age question. I mean, you could have done a whole long section on that, you know, showing the extreme age difference that's just, you know, ubiquitous um, gender gender, you know, uh, specifics for how old you're allowed to be. Um, and, and, you know, another side street was, you know, sort of like a whole section on when, if, when the male body is, I mean, there's a little bit of it towards the end, but, you know, the, some of the points that we brought up towards the end, like, it, you know, is a queer male body photographed like a woman? Um, often, yes. 
you know, and often not in a, in a so-called negative way, but this, let's say a filmmaker like Elmo Devar will often do like a body pan of a, of a male body and it's um, definitely, it's a feminized male body. Um, and it's not necessarily a negative thing, but it's just still following the rule. Um, you know, and then I also noticed this other thing, which, which uh, it was just too complicated to get into, but there is a time where you get a close-up on a male heterosexual body, and that is when that body is wounded or scarred. So uh, that was kind of mind-boggling, because I, I had a lot of examples of that, but then we just felt like that would just be too much of a, of a side street, and it would throw off the, you know, the, the one flow. So those, those were a few things that I was sad to, to lose, but um, in the interest of, you know, the kind of the total message, the total flow. Um, yeah, um, it's interesting. I was just um, sp speaking with uh, Julie Pierce from the BFI. Uh, there's, some, there's some different laws in Europe you know, and, and even I think Britain is different from France um, versus the U.S. So uh, we made the film under U.S. law um, under what it's called fair use. I think here it's called fair dealing. Um, and if we had had to license the clips and pay for them, I think it, it would have been like a $5 million film. It, would, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, not only the money, but we would have had to ask permission, and, and many of those people probably would deny permission, <laughs> right? So um, luckily, we were under fair use. Every single clip is under fair use. Um, fair use means it, 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 it um, what is it, you know, it passes the bar of the legal definition in the United States. It has to be a cultural critique, it has to be historical, it has to be educational, it has to be transformative. What they call transformative means that I'm using the clip in a way that's not how it was originally meant to be seen. I'm shining a new light on it. Um, I'm using it you know, for all of those other purposes. And obviously I am. And, but that said, we had an attorney, um, the top fair use attorney in uh, the United States, the top firm, and they reviewed the film, you know, top to bottom probably five times, but on top of that, they reviewed little sections. They reviewed every single clip. And um, there were times where they were like, well, this one, borderline, better take it out. Um, so, there were times where they said, um, yes, the sequence is great, but you have to add a, a voiceover to make it fly. Or, you know, so, you know, there were times where I was like, I hope I don't have to use a voiceover. Like, at the end where all the women are staring at the screen, I was like, please, God, don't make me put a voiceover there. Um, and he didn't, so that was good. <laughs> Well, I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I feel like, you know, they're sort of simultaneously two things, you know. On the one hand, I do think there's been some change, and um, there's no doubt whatsoever that this film would never have been financed or, you know, bought for distribution um, before these two major events. The one was the EEOC investigation in the United States where the Hollywood studios were threatened with billions of dollars of fines if they didn't stop their illegal sex discrimination. That was 2015. And shortly after that, you know, the Harvey Weinstein story and the Me Too movement. Those two things together created an environment where this film could be made, create an environment where the Cannes Film Festival is embarrassed if they have all male directors in the competition, or you know, even if they have 75% male directors, they're still embarrassed. That's completely new. I mean, think back five, seven years ago, it, it, you were you know really uncool to even mention this kind of thing. You know, so have we made progress? Yes, I think there's progress. You know, that said. Um, I think there's a lot of backlash. I mean, today we had the, uh, you know, the Trump verdict came out and he was found uh, guilty on the civil case of sexual assault. 
And, um, you know, it made me re remember the whole Access Hollywood tape and, you know, when, when it came out, it was also, you know, right around the time that all this stuff was, was happening. Um, and people said, wow, it's amazing that he got elected even though that tape came out, you know? And I think, you know, it's rather more accurate to say he got elected because that tape came out. There are so many people who loved this kind of extremely sexist, violent, misogynistic, racist guy. They love it and they elected him because of it. So it's almost, you know, it's sort of like with a movement forward, then there's like an equal movement of backlash. Um, hopefully the forward will, you know, move ahead uh, eventually. But I, I think both energies are really present right now. I mean, you know, I don't know about um, in Europe, but in, in the United States, we've been invited to, um, you know, all the major film schools. We had a big event at the UC USC Film School. Um, we're having a big event at the UCLA Film School, uh, actually the week after I come, go home. Um, we've been at Tufts University. We've been, I, I can't even remember, a very long list of film schools that have invited the film. Um, besides that, the film is available for free in the United States on Canopy, which is sort of like the public library of films. Um, and it's the educational streamer. Um, and I believe that it's more and more being, you know, I've heard from people, I mean, I, I actually, I get like five emails a day or on Instagram from all over the world, you know, and a lot of it is from people saying, I want to use your film as a teaching tool. So yes, I think it's going to be used as a teaching tool in film schools, and I think that it might make a difference, because I definitely know that this stuff was not taught, um, you know, it, it, was, it was not taught, I mean, I, you know, so, some people are like, well, yeah, Laura Mulvey said it in 1975, um, do we need this? And, you know, it's like, well, first of all, we need it because even though she said in 1975, nothing changed <laughs> until the EEOC investigation in 2015. And even then, you know. Um, but secondly, you know, generally, at least in the United States, the, um, you know, the film theory crowd tends to be, you know, like extremely divorced from the film production crowd. And they don't really even talk to each other. And the majority of people who go to film school in the United States for production, um, you know, they, they never even heard of uh, Laura Mulvey, let alone any of these other people. So what, what, because I'm a filmmaker, I'm not a theorist, but I'm a, you know, I'm a cinematographer and I'm a filmmaker, I think that, you know, bringing this kind of almost extreme practical <laughs> perspective. It's like, let's just look, you know, where do you put the camera? How do you move it? How do you light it? Like, forget psychoanalysis, forget all that. Let's just be so, so, in a way, simple. It's not simple at all, of course, but, you know, it is clear, you know? And when you show that to film students or film makers, you know, they get it. And they get it in a whole nother way than, you know, like, castration, anxiety, and all that stuff, which of course is all really interesting and relevant, but um, this way it's more like just, you know, almost like very concrete. And what I do like about the film as well is that you do make that connection between theory and reality in a very and lived experience and what we watch, you know, in popular culture. And the Laura Mulvey essay is 50, or the essay itself was 1975, but she gave the talk in 1973. Yeah. So it's 50 this year. So it's 50 year old theory that still has this incredibly strong uh, influence and resonance in film culture. And I think it's really exciting that this film is bringing it to a wider audience as well. And oh, yeah, I hope yeah, so. Yeah, bringing yeah. Laura to a wider audience. Yeah, Laura Mulvey and the Me Too movement. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, you know, the thing, the thing about it is that, you know, it's not about sex per se or nudity per se. It's about objectification. And object, an, an object doesn't exist in a vacuum. An object only exists in relation to a subject. So that's the, you know, the important thing. Because, you know, we're like, objectification of women, 
you know, as if it's floating around in the in in the nether netherland, but it's 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 in relation to a subject. So it's a power relation. So it's not the nudity per se or sex per se. That's what we were trying to show, you know, towards the end of the film, like examples of nudity and sex where it's not objectification, where they're two subjects, you know. So that is, you know, a little bit of a, of a slant, you know. We're saying, like, do women have to be objectified, you know? Can, can we have um, two subjects who have a sexual relationship when it's a heterosexual situation? You know, for most people, that's a very radical idea, and they can't even uh, have no idea how to even think about it. Um, and it's very painful. <laughs> You know, I mean, this is not an academic discussion, right? It's a painful discussion. <laughs> it's a painful situation. So that's one point. The other point is, what about advertising budgets and distribution? You know, like Blade Runner 2049 had a $100 million advertising budget. Like, what, what happens if Brainwash Sex Camera Power has a $100 million advertising budget? <laughs> You know, and, and women are systematically given worse uh, distribution deals and less, um, less advertising. I mean, even if their film is, is, is sexy in the traditional way, they're still going to get less. So it's, you know, it's not really quite that simple as just like, well, we want to make money. You know, it's like, it's, it, it's, all, it's all part of the knot. Well, I mean, um, we are showing all my other films, and you could say that all my films are about this in a way, in different ways, um, very, all very different, um, and a completely different approach, a more um, maybe avant-garde kind of approach, uh, you might say, although they're, these are narrative films, but they're, um, they're unusual narrative films. Um, so that struggle is certainly at the core of what I what I'm looking at in my films and exploring in my in my own uh, you know fictional films. Um, as for you know, have I figured it out myself? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I probably uh, am better now than you know 20 years ago, but I, I still think that it's it's so deep. It's so. It's so incredible when you think about it that, you know, a man is allowed to be a subject and a sexual subject. And, you know, as women, we're trained that our sexuality is being in the object position, so it's split off from our subjecthood. And, I mean, I, I, most women have experienced this, and it's very unpleasant, and it's very hard to it's, it's, it, I don't have an easy answer, but yeah, therapy helped me. I did. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, there was, there was, you know, Woman in the Dunes. Um, there's, a, there, the, there's a sex scene um, where the way it's photographed, the, the male body and the female body is photographed so similarly that you really cannot, you cannot distinguish like which body is which. It, it, you know, I had a fight with the editor. I wanted to keep it in. And she thought it was like just one too many examples. So um, I, that was, that's an example. But if you look at that film as a whole, it still is really from the man's perspective. I mean, it's his, it's his subjective experience. And she is, you know, the sexual other, um, even in that film. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I would have to um, think on that. I mean, I certainly, you know, I love the films of Antonioni. I think he speaks to the alienation and, and the nightmare of being the sexual object in his own way. Um, you know, those women, I always related a lot to his films in terms of those female characters. Um, you know, that said, she, you know, Monica Vitti, I mean, she is the mysterious object of desire still, no matter what. And I mean, some of those films, I love Antonioni. I love Vertigo. I think Vertigo is a masterpiece, you know, sign me up for, 
for that, um, at the same time we can say, well, you know, it can be a masterpiece. Red Desert is a masterpiece. You know, La Ventura is a masterpiece. You know, some of Fellini's films are masterpieces. La Dolce Vita. I, these these directors, um, they're they're so deep and brilliant that you kind of forgive them <laughs> the 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 sexualization of of the you know the the. So I don't know. I, bad answer. I don't. <laughs> But if you find some, send us them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> um, so we have to wrap now, unfortunately. Um, but just to finish, I just want to say to ask you what you're working on at the moment. If you have anything that you want to talk about that's in development, or is the focus oh. just on brainwashed right now? Uh, any producers out there? Yeah, yeah I've got. Um, I have two scripts, um, two feature scripts that I'd love to get going. Um, and uh, if you're interested, uh, please reach out. <laughs> and as, as far as um, brainwashed, you know, it does help us uh, a lot um, if you, you know, get the word out on social media because we don't have a big advertising budget. Um, at Mancus Film, at Brainwash Movie um, is our Instagram, and you can also reach out to me personally that way. And uh, if you didn't have a chance to get your question out. I'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much for the great uh, uh, reception. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Nina.